The Secrets of Star Wars is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Hello there. Obi-Wan Kenobi here, also known as James Arnold Taylor, the voice of Obi-Wan. Jedi Master Plo Koon. And many other characters in the world of Star Wars. You're listening to... Shh, don't tell. It's the secrets of Star Wars. May the Force be with you. You're listening to The Secrets of Star Wars, Episode 168. Hello there. It's a power that Jedi have that lets them control people and make things float. Impressive. Every word in that sense was wrong. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. This station is now the ultimate power in the universe. I find your lack of faith disturbing. It's against my programming to impersonate a deity. That's not how the Force works. Force is with me, and I am with the Force, and I fear nothing. Remember, the Force will be with you, always. Hello, I'm Jason Yuji, and you're listening to the Secrets of Star Wars podcast, where we talk about everything connected to that galaxy far, far away. From movies to books to TV shows and more, we're looking at the deeper themes and meanings found in Star Wars. Today we're discussing Star Wars Vision 2, Visions Season 2, Episode 9, Ao Song. Join me today on the panel. First up, we have the resident expert, Catherine the Artist Laffery. Welcome back, Catherine. Hello. Thanks for having me back. Next up, we have Chris Hagen. How's it going, Chris? Very good. Looking forward to talking about this episode. And last, but certainly not least, we have the guardian of the wheels himself, Robert King. Thanks for joining us, Robert. Thanks for having me. It's always great to be here. So I've been thinking that Chris and I need call tags. I'm partial to Mando myself since I have the Mando helmet. And uh, but I'm not sure if it's going to conflict with Andrew holding the Mudhorn moniker. So we'll have to let Bindu make that call. And Chris, you had an idea about yours you were telling me on Slack today. What would that be? Well, uh, it comes from the uh, latest Father's Day gift, a la my wife and her creative mind. Uh, and it's a T-shirt that says the Dadalorian on it. And it has um, perhaps a grizzled image of me looking like Mando with seven Grogu-like images in the, the little floating bassinet to represent my seven children so uh, uh yeah it's got some cheese to it but it's i think it's going to be the dadalorian do your children have long ears I and like are it. they green <laughs> well the genes on my well now i just yeah I, I can't go into their <laughs> details like that <laughs> oh, nice. they all know they all use the force though so it's uh yeah. <laughs> well, I approve. I accept. That's awesome. With that, let's get into Ao Song. Non-canonically set in 19 BBY, which is pretty much the same time as the events of Revenge of the Sith, Clone Wars Season 7, Bad Batch Season 1, and Order 66, just to give you an idea of where that would be in the timeline and what would be happening in the galaxy around that time period. The official description from Wikipedia is an alien child who longs to sing, is raised by her loving but stern father to stay quiet because of the calamitous effect her voice has on the crystals in the nearby mines. The studio this time was Triggerfish Animation Studios out of Cape Town, South Africa. It was written and directed by Nadia Darius and Daniel Clark. Since the tradition has been on these vision episodes to talk about the art to start with, we're going to start with the artist Catherine. What did you think about the animation style this time? Oh, I love this animation style. This is the second time we've seen it in Visions 2, where they make uh, computer animation actually look like stop motion animation. Uh, they add just enough imperfection to make you wonder if it was manipulated by hand, which digitally it is. So that kind of gives a good feel to it. Um, and then they did a great job inspiring the other animators working on this by making tiny little uh, models of the characters out of wool felt. And they're absolutely adorable to look at. Go see the extras. They're really cute. And I would love to have one like sitting on my desk. They're adorable. And then not, I mean, just the, the whole setting where they work is a beautiful space and it really shows in their work. 
Um, the mountainside, the coastline of South Africa really shows through in this piece. And so many beautiful little extras, little flowers, and just the way the rocks move and everything is gorgeous. What do you think, Chris? Well, uh, thinking about how uh, beautiful the scenery was and such, uh, this is something I thought of that might pertain a little bit to the story, but everybody there must get over their fear of heights at a very young age uh, hmm. because yeah. <laughs> they don't use railings, kind of like the Empire. Uh, so all those mountainside <laughs> paths and such, I mean, uh, they got to be okay with that. And um, the the brightness of the color palette, it was all very vibrant. And uh, that sort of gave the whole episode a very um, a joyful tone to it uh, until you got into the caves. But uh, yeah, what'd you think, Robert? Yeah, I I agree. I mean, it was uh, beautiful, and the detail was astounding. And more than any other episode of uh, Visions, I think this one really felt like you could touch what was going on on the screen. It you were looking at it, and I was feeling the texture of those. Um, sort of wool felt uh uh creatures um to the extent that like they were definitely meant to look like dolls and yet they moved like just native inhabitants of that world and it was like is this a world in which like dolls are real it was it was it was just so beautifully done yeah, I, I thought the ethereal backgrounds were just amazing when whenever uh, she was singing and it sort of took you into the force or mm -hmm. when they were showing the kyber crystals sort of in x-ray, the that was when I was definitely like, okay, this is CGI. But when they started with the the first vision of the first time you see Ao on that mountain and she's climbing that rope, the rope just sort of the way it swings back and forth, you can see the stop motion in it. But to, to know that they did that all with CGI is pretty impressive. So there's one other scene that fooled me where I really had to question, was it all CGI or was there some stop motion? Was when she and her dad were riding on their speeder and they did a stop motion trick of having the landscape turn under them. Yes. It's like, okay, I know they said it's computer animation but that looked exactly like stop motion trickery and i loved it it was beautiful to add that detail yeah for sure so for a bit of a breakdown on this episode the opening explanation um i was wondering about the what you guys thought about the crawl at the very beginning why why did we need a crawl do you think that uh we needed that to get to where where we, you know, so we understood the story. It mentions that the planet Corva was used to be full of kyber crystals until the Sith poisoned them and turned them all red. The people of Corva have learned to mine the crystals so that they can give them to the Jedi to be purified seemingly one at a time, and it's very difficult to do so. So do you think we would have gotten there without that crawl? I needed it, for sure. It was helpful. But at the same time, it had me place this at like 1000 BBY. I thought for sure this oh. was like within a generation of the Sith Jedi War. Thinking that, you know, this was part of the Sith trying to, you know, affect what the Jedi could do by completely destroying these crystals. So when I saw that it was 19 BBY, it just... It didn't compute. It still doesn't stick in my head. My head canon with it being older just fit better for me. I I agree. Yeah, it um it felt it felt very much just before the Clone Wars or outside the context of the Clone Wars at least. Um and I get that this is supposed to be like this backwater world in which you know, at one point um the father says to Au, you know, you will be the first of our people to go out into the stars. So these are people who really don't know anything of the rest of the galaxy. 
but the Jedi who comes, um, what's her name? Katu, um, Kratu, Kratu. Thank you. Kratu, um, yeah. she does not act like she's coming from a war torn galaxy. And so I, I, I don't know. This is a nitpick, but it's, you know, yeah, it kind of like 19 BBY. Really? <laughs> Maybe Wikipedia got that wrong. Yeah, the 19 BBY doesn't make sense to me because that would be Order 66 time. Um, uh, none of the other Jedi mention any other place to get kyber crystals, really, except for um, Ilum during that time. So, And then I also wanted to say that one of the things I thought the crawl did that was very helpful for the audience is that we've never seen um kyber crystals that need to be mined that would already be bled already be red uh mm -hmm. we've only seen them in their purified form and it's only when they get corrupted seemingly one little crystal at a time uh that they turn red so the crawl i think helped us understand why would there be all these red kyber crystals and also why would they be mining them and be good people in doing it uh, it's because they provide that for the Jedi to purify one at a time. It makes me wonder, too. The place seems so peaceful and the people just so relaxed and actually enjoying their mining job mm -hmm. that for a Sith to come there and corrupt that many crystals, I feel like there should have been some scarring somewhere. Like, I would have never known that a Sith Lord had gone in there and corrupted that many crystals. Did anybody else on the, when we had that crawl, did anybody else see a little cross, a little star in the shape of a cross right above the crawl? Oh, missed that one. Hmm, not and then as, as the, as the cameras panning down away from the crawl toward the planet and, Oh, there's another one. And it's in a, just a perfect little cross. I don't know if they put that in there on purpose or if it was just su supposed to signify a twinkling star or something, but I noticed two of those. I thought that was interesting. So we see the first shot of Au on the planet Korba. She's repelling to pick flower blossoms off the side of a cliff, and she climbs up to see the sunrise and a stunning view of the rock formations. Is that where you got the, uh, the South Africa vibes there, Catherine? Yeah, it's funny. My first two viewings of this, I could not get Alaska out of my head. Oh, yeah. I thought the mm. characters and their seal-like faces, because I'm in the Northern Hemisphere, I never thought of South African seals. I was thinking of more like Alaska and then having their little broth soup that they had. All of it made me think yeah. Alaska for some reason. We're probably watching too much Deadliest Catch. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it is Shark Week, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. And see, then once Shark Week came on and they you know, started seeing, you know, Air Jaws in South Africa, and then it's like, okay, now I'm seeing the rock formations and the seagulls flying, and oh, there's the seals. Okay. No, but the, the way they're bundled up and with the, the head coverings that they have and so on, it does give the impression of a, of a pretty cold environment. And and I've never been to South Africa and I don't know what the weather is like there, but I usually see it depicted as pretty sunny and I interpret that as warm. It is the southern tip of, of Africa, though, so I, I don't know what the latitude would be, but it's probably at least pretty temperate, if not cold, at least some of the time. Yeah. It's not as far south as Chile. But Fair, it's, yeah. It's close. <laughs> I wanted to point out something I noticed in that in that opening shot that um, it took repeated viewings to see. She's looking at the double spire in the distance that is where she actually is going to go in. And that's where she first has the voices of the crystals calling to her from that spire. Um, I thought that was nice that that was in there, that they didn't just spell it out, but she sort of had to get comfortable with watching it to see that oh chris you're gonna have to look again there's one more. thing you might have missed 
<laughs> the shape in between the spires as the sun is shining through it is the crystal that you see at the very end. Okay. Oh. So it, it plays that. forward to the Kyra crystal that you see at the end. It's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> so I noticed during that first scene that as, as they start, see it, she climbs to the top of the cliff and she's looking over all those uh, rock formations and the birds and all that scenery. You, I didn't realize it until the second or third time I watched it, but there's no music at all. It's just perfectly silent. And, and then when she, she sees, I think she's feeling the, the crystals at that moment and she starts to sing and that's the first music that we get. But for that, I think there's music during the crawl, but then when they start showing her view of the scenery, it's just dead silent. And I didn't realize that at first, you know, we're so used to the music being in the background that a lot of times we don't even catch it. But all of a sudden I was like, when she started seeing, I'm like, there was no sound there before. And I had to back it up and check it out. And I thought it was a, you know, a beautiful comparison juxtaposition between her silent, the silence and then her song. And it really emphasized you know, that her song and her singing is, is where we need to be focused. So as she's standing there, Au sees a yellow spaceship descending through the atmosphere, and she acrobatically heads home to her father, Abat. The spaceship, it turns out, belongs to a Jedi named Kratu, who has come to see if her, the kyber crystals in the new mine are able to be purified. She has her doubts. She thinks they're too strong and... Uh, Poisoned, basically. As Kratu and Abat discuss the crystals, Au begins to sing as if instinctively, and the crystal reacts, burning Abat's glove. Abat chastises Au, but Kratu sees that Au is called by the crystals and is simply reacting. What did you guys think of this first scene? I thought it was a great way to demonstrate both the power of her voice and her song and the danger that they're responding to. Um, I thought it, um, because yeah, from that first scene, we're in, we're in this beautiful sort of pastoral natural setting. We hear her voice. It's beautiful. It would be really easy to just think, Oh, well, you know, voice good, um, anti voice bad, but by showing, that she actually hurts her father doing this. Um, it, it makes the, the drama of the story really relatable and, and, um, and yet it's also that, that, you know, beauty of the Jedi insight, right. That, um, that sees beyond just what happens to asking, well, why is this happening? And, and what else is going on here and being sensitive to the movements of the force, which are not always easy to understand, um, you know, like the movements of some other spirits we know that might be called holy. What, one thing I thought that scene also showed well was her relationship with her father in terms of his expectations with her voice, because she has that muffle that um, is around her neck and as she gets home and and just peers into the door she pulls it up over her mouth because her father wants it up over her mouth to protect right. her voice um, and then when she's out at the window listening she's you know obviously lets it slip down and such so uh, visually i liked the way that showed how she wants to respect her father um, but there's this call that's a bit in conflict with that or what her father wants yeah and you could see her loving respect for her father when she serves him dinner and you know she's trying to be the big girl in this you know i can do it with that <laughs> giant kettle she's trying to carry um one sad thought that went through my mind though because her father is so firm about her not using her voice and he shows her his glove and how it's burnt is where's Aou's mother? Mm -hmm. So it made me wonder when she was a baby and we know babies just make noises and coos and things. Is it possible that her voice 
may have been connected with the loss of her mother. And her wow. father doesn't want to lose her in some accident. And so he's, that's probably why he's so protective of, please don't, it hurts. And she might not even know that happened. Probably doesn't know it happened because she's just such a joyful little girl. That, but yeah, I there you go, one downer in all of that. No. <laughs> well, no, I, because I had a similar question. Um, but, and, and, and I had wondered, I thought, well, maybe, maybe she had, you know, through her voice done something to hurt or, or cause the death of her mother. But no, if, if that had happened, they absolutely would have put that in the, the narrative somewhere and they didn't. So, but I like that idea that maybe, maybe her father's been protecting her from like the truth of that. That's, that's an interesting thought. Because he's never let her go fully into voice because of the way the crystals react at first. And so if he automatically thinks, well, the first reaction is something bad happens, then it's like, oh, we can't, we can't let this something bad happen. So the only other thing was, man, I hope her mother wasn't lost when the Sith showed up and ruined the crystals. So all of this would have been when she was probably, you know, an infant or something. Yeah. Because it doesn't really show how old she is. I think I saw somewhere that, um, oh, the directors uh, put her at 10. Oh, okay. That that reads about right. Yeah. I, I had the idea that the Sith corrupting all the crystals happened like a long time ago, like generations in the past. But yes. Yeah. Yeah. Again, timeline in this in this shorter, it's kind of muddled, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So we were talking about that. Uh, I I would have called it a buff that she was wearing that thing that covers her face. Um. Why do you think that it the cold? I never thought about the idea of it being cold. That I mean, well, they're wearing gloves. You know, it seems to be cold there, right? Um. But is that is that to suppress her voice and? You know, there when that when this was being made, I'm sure it took quite a couple years to make this. We were going through something like that, and we were all having to suppress our voice. We couldn't go to church. We were having to wear those masks. I wonder if that's sort of a, a statement of where they were at when they were having to make that. I wonder if they had to wear masks the entire time they were making that together. Well, from the uh, the behind the scenes footage, they never showed anyone in the studio wearing a mask. So, but it could be a callback to we can all relate to the feeling. Everyone around yeah. the world was stuck with that feeling. What was really neat, though, is later on in the episode when her father goes to work, Au helps adjust her father's shoulder pads. And I noticed that his shoulder pads are the same color and almost same material as her muff. Mm -hmm. So they're both protective items. I thought that was kind of a neat plan. So he, she's, she's helping her dad get his shoulder pads on to go to work. And he turns around and fix her muff. Of course, she pulls it down as soon as he walks away, like any 10 year old would. So I'm going to come back to... Um, the, the voice being suppressed here in a little bit when we talk about the directors. Uh, but both Au and Abat go to work. Abat in the mines and Au seemingly a caretaker of animals. Again, Abat pulls up her buff over her mouth. We talked about that. While working, Au begins to hear the call of the crystals and decides that she must go to them acrobatically again. And without any fear, she jumps from cliff to cliff and climbs to the entrance of the mine, which is a cross a rope bridge anybody see the future with that rope bridge not the first viewing <laughs> <laughs> i mean a rickety bridge is always a rickety bridge um yeah i i had a feeling that that bridge was coming down at some point yeah i i don't know mm -hmm. if i had quite the presentiment but it was it was definitely rickety enough that it was like ooh, danger in the environment <laughs> So Au finds a side entrance of the mine. She timid, timidly begins to sing, and the kyber crystals activate. The more she sings, the more activity the crystals show. Everything seems calm until her father catches her and once again suppresses her voice. 
What do you guys think about inside the mine with all those crystals coming to life? I might have to backtrack for a second, though, to her animal okay, care. Okay, go ahead. She used <laughs> her voice to calm the little louse that was attached to the animal. Oh, yeah. And it was so sweet because she looks around first, like, is it okay? And she has that quiet little hum to calm the animal. She pries it off. And when she flipped that thing over, I was like, oh, my gosh, why does it have to be so cute? <laughs> I don't like it's bugs, but why does this one have to be so cute? It's like, that one I would love as a little stuffed animal. It'd be adorable because it would look like a pillow until you flip it over. But yeah, just that little, you know, kind of like premonition of like what she can do. Her calming, joyful sound just made this little bug happy and scurry away. And it was really neat. And I think the bugs also played a part in helping her get to the other entrance too which was pretty neat they were yeah, there she with was her. following him into the cave yeah yeah what'd you guys think about when uh all those crystals activated though it was i thought it was beautiful except that they're red i mean red is bad in star wars <laughs> 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 any other thoughts well uh as they responded to her call at we don't know this until later when they get purified, but they go through this stage where they are dangerous. And mm -hmm. I think her father, at that moment when he pulls her out, then, you know, the next scene you see is there's like an explosion coming out of the mine a bit. So um, if, if uh, Wu doesn't finish her song with them, they are left in a dangerous state that uh, yeah. you need to do something about. Yeah, that's why everything seemed calm until her father makes her stop singing and now they've been activated, but there's nothing left hanging on. And now they're, it's almost like they're in the raw form where they're just volatile. Chris, you made me think of uh, the, in the Bible where they talk about um, the spirits being taken out of a home and if the house isn't swept clean, then it'll be worse. And that's what yeah. it, it made me feel like she was. And all the time when you hear her hearing the voices, they sound mournful and melancholy. They're reaching out for help. And she's sensing that. And you can tell she's trying to heal them. She's just like she did the care for the little animal. She's trying to heal them. And so seeing the way she reacted to it, where it's like, I, I know I can fix you. I know I can do this. And then having that interrupted, and it made me think of like, you know, when we try to help someone and maybe we don't take that next step of praying for them. Maybe we're just helping them physically and we're forgetting there's a whole spiritual aspect to this. And so she took, takes it that step farther and really goes to the heart of the problem. What was really neat is in the behind the scenes, the voices we hear are a children's choir and they're using St. George Cathedral, uh, Anglican Cathedral in um, Cape Town. It's a beautiful neo-Gothic church and stone. So you get that incredible Gothic echo. I mean, best acoustics in the world, go to a Gothic stone church, hands down the best. And, uh, they use, you know, ch the children's choir to sing this. But the director also said he looked into Bulgarian choir music because it had that melancholy sound. And he was focusing mostly on a D minor chord, which throws that mood of melancholy and, can, you know, distress into everything. So I thought that was really neat how they just, the visuals, the audios are all just playing into the whole story. That insight from the directors helped me think of uh, the scripture talking about creation groaning, um, awaiting for the revealing of the Son of God. This, um, there's something broken in our world, too, that is reaching out for its own redemption. Um, and I, I like the way that that's portrayed with these kyber crystals are not okay being corrupted. Yeah, yeah. And I know our Secrets of Middle Earth people are going to be all up on, you know, there's the singing of creation into being. And I don't know all that yet because I didn't read all of that book yet. But <laughs> there's something about bad singing and good singing. It's it's right at the beginning of the Silmarillion. It's, it's yeah. Okay. 
<laughs> so as things start to go south inside the mine, Au and Abat escape only to be trapped on the falling rope bridge. Of course, the bridge failed. As Abat and Au fall, Kratu uses her lightsaber to safely slow her descent off a cliff in order to catch the two of them with the force and use the force shield to continually repel falling debris. Au sees her time to shine. She sheds the buff, stands confidently inside the force shield, and begins to sing. All of the crystals inside the mountains are seen as if through an x-ray was picking them up through the stone. And as Au sings, the crystals begin to change color, and she's purifying them all with her little voice, instead of one at a time. Well, something that struck me on repeated viewing was we never see how the Jedi would purify a crystal. And so, um, you know, we were talking about the, the destruction that happened when, when our song was interrupted. And now we see like the whole process of it. Um, and I kind of wondered if, Kratu had recognized that, oh yes, the the kind of volatility of the crystal is a stage in its purification. If if the Jedi purification also went through a similar stage, um and that's what kind of gave her the confidence to uh support Au in taking these risks. When she first lands on the bridge with them, or the rock bridge, doesn't she say, though, do you want to run? So, like, can you run, oh, I think? can you because, run? I, because, because the father is injured. Yes. Yeah. So was that meant for both of them or just the father? Can you run? I think just the father. Okay. But it might have been also encouraging Au to help her dad. I, yeah. Yeah, I took it as, like, here we are in this rock storm and she's she's like using the force to deflect the rocks from them but it's like we've got to get out of here like she's very much in jedi rescue moment and yeah because she's expecting the crystals to all explode and stuff right so yeah she but Au was like nope i can fix this she just knew she just had that innate i can do this and I, I think part of that was, you know, back at the house earlier, uh, Kratu said, you know, it takes courage to answer that call. And then in the moment, Kratu's eyes just kind of go wide and she she just silently says, all right. You, you know, she's she's like just there for Au. Um, whereas the father is very clearly scared and confused. But... Um, but Kratu is like, oh, okay, now I see what's going on. And I took it as support anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the only other Jedi we know who's purified a Sith crystal is Ahsoka. Right. And we saw it in the Tales of the Jedi when she uh. took down that, um, it wasn't full Sith, but the Inquisitor. And she, she has purified his crystals to make her white lightsabers so she didn't have the white lightsabers in clone wars nope they were blue or green blue oh okay i think even the season seven ones mm -hmm. that anakin gave her i'm and gonna have to rewatch those were not white yeah they weren't white okay. until those after blue. she was yeah i'm pretty sure Okay. Yes. Now and I'm then questioning she buried myself. them with all the. <laughs> didn't she bury those lightsabers with all the clones? True. Right. Yeah. So that they would be found yeah. and she would be thought dead. Okay. Yeah. So I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, little voices um, having a big impact, especially when not suppressed. Uh, and I wanted to talk a little bit about the directors. So one of the directors, directors Nadia Darius, um, was they were doing an article, and she has a quote in this article from Arts and Culture from February twenty eighth of twenty three, and she starts by talking about the father Abat, and she's quoted as saying, "We wanted him to be relatable, empathetic, and a good guy. 
He's just trying to protect his daughter, but that doesn't exactly fit with who she wants to be. For Darius, the director, this chimed with her own past growing up in a conservative Muslim household. The men are always singing, she says. It seems beautiful, but when women were never really allowed. That's exactly what Darius wanted to do, though. So in order to fill this void, she would sneak out and sing in rock bands. We always sucked, said Darius. <laughs> but making music and singing was so powerful. I, want, I was able to change huge connections through singing and music. There are so many cultures where singing and chanting connect people, not just to each other, but to the spirit and the land. So it, it just seems like she was using her experience and putting her experience into Au and living through Au mm -hmm. through in, in this in this little 15 minute video, you know, cartoon. What do you guys think about that? It's fun in the extras video, watching the video clips of her and uh, I think his name's Daniel, the other producer writer as Daniel they act Clark, out yeah. scenes. And so it's yeah, a, yeah. a great animation tool, a great artist tool. I, I've done it myself where I'll like take pictures of myself and use my hands to kind of get just the right pose. You know, the little wooden mannequins don't always cut it. So, yeah, it's a, it's a fun, <laughs> fun technique just to kind of, and it puts you in your art. And it was neat to see how much of herself she put into this. It made it more relatable and just a beautiful story. Yeah, I think that stories where the author or the artist, the creator makes them personal without it being autobiographical strictly, just make very powerful stories. And, um, uh, one thing I liked hearing about or how singing was so much a center of this is I thought about um, Christians are just known for singing hymns, uh, chant. It's just been and with the Psalms, the Psalms encourage us to sing again and again. Uh, so singing is very much a part of Christian spirituality. Yeah, I went right back to reading uh, Pius X's uh, Motu Proprio on sacred music just because it's it's so vital um it it can't it can't be eliminated from our lit liturgy it's so important to the liturgy the psalms are meant to be sung so it almost sounds strange to hear them just spoken you want to hear them at least chanted as they've yeah. been since they were written and uh yeah, this really made me think about it just because um, in his motu proprio, he talked about um, that the, the necessity of, of sacred music is to um, lift the understanding of the faithful to its proper aim and greater efficiency um, in order that the faithful may be more easily moved to devotion and better disposed for the reception of the fruits and grace belonging to the celebration of the most holy mysteries. So you can see how our singing lifted those crystals out of the darkness to be able to receive that, that grace of purification. That's a good tie. I like it. Yeah. And as, as we were talking about before it, the singing always seems to have like a healing aspect to it. Like it, it, you know, it soothes the animal. It's, it, it soothes the, the little parasitic bug, the cute parasitic bug. Um, <laughs> very cute, very it, cute. Uh, it, it heals the, the agony that the crystals seem to feel. Um, and, and there's a sense in which that's exactly what singing does, what music does. I mean, music therapy has been, uh, around, I mean, at least in the Western tradition, going back to the Greeks, I'm, I'm not sure about how it's been treated in other traditions, but, um, yeah. And the, the idea of, of we sing to, um, enter into or, or dispose ourselves to open ourselves up to, uh, the, the grace of the mysteries is, um, you know, it's, it's a tool of overcoming temptation and sin. And I'm just remembering that it's not just us who are singing, but it's the angels singing too. Uh, and they lead us in right. some of the songs, having 
when Christ is born uh, and the heavenly liturgy. They're called yep. choirs of angels, yeah. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> Our singing is so good that the very last crystal you see is clear. It's diamond clear. Mm -hmm. And we, we've never seen a whole group of clear crystals. They're always blue or green. I mean, Mace Windows is purple, but that that was his little bleeding of his Sith style of fighting in there, but his little blue and red. But just seeing that it was crystal clear was awesome. And then that's why I really wanted this to take place farther back, because then I imagined all these purified crystals being used for the temple guards. And then maybe, hmm. you know, that kind of what well, would, it, would inspire Ray. <laughs> and, and at the end, the, the last scene is she's taken off in that, or she's flying in that ship. There's those big crystals, the ones that are, you know, the size of the spaceship, and they're crystal clear, too. I mean, they're perfectly clear. So she must have done a number on the whole planet. I think so, yeah. It makes sense that they're clear, because this is South African, and we're talking about South African culture. So then I had to look up about diamonds, and some of the biggest and best diamonds have come out of South Africa. And they actually oh. said that. It was um, South Africa that created what is now the modern trade in diamonds because they were so easily mined and the, the companies that came in actually ended up doing more good than damage, including setting up wildlife sanctuary schools, towns, everything, that it created the, the diamond market so that middle class could actually own a diamond and so they're saying that they're and yet there's that whole history of blood diamonds right right i i wonder if like the the you know coming from the the crawl at the beginning this idea of you know these these mm -hmm. pure crystals these beautiful you know gems are are tainted by blood yep. and need to be purified i wonder i wonder if that's part of what they had in mind was, you know. Yeah, I wondered that too. Diamonds. So I looked it, looked it up, oh, and the American. Oh, good. American, <laughs> uh, yeah, the the AGI American Gemology Institute actually says that the South African diamond industry now is like ninety nine point eight percent, um, pure, so to speak. There are no conflict diamonds; they call them now instead of blood diamonds. Okay. Yeah. So they really make it a point to run it in the right way. So it's kind of fascinating. Well, they actually good said to hear. that when the South African diamond rush started, and I think it was eighteen late eighteen hundreds, they said that there were more diamonds found in two thousand years, um, or more diamonds found in South Africa in the rush time than in two thousand years in India. The diamonds were that available they said like a shepherd boy would be walking along and oh what's this shiny rock <laughs> and wow. just pick up a huge diamond <laughs> wow this is what i've enjoyed about the visions episodes this season is that they each are very rooted in the places where the studios are that made them that's right mm -hmm. yeah 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 like with the the other episode you were talking about that looked like cgi out of chile how they used mm -hmm. their own story you know, not having water and all that and imposing that on, on the empire. I thought that was really interesting. Mm -hmm. So Kratu, the Jedi, offers Au the opportunity to go with her and develop her voice. She has two weeks, a fortnight to decide. Uh, Au, Au cho chooses to go. So as they, she was getting ready to leave, it seemed to me... And you guys might shoot holes in this theory, but it seemed to me to be the happiest departure of a Jedi at, a, at an age of reason that I've ever seen. Every other time a Jedi is sort of taken from their family at an age of reason, they're, they're upset about it. They're, they're thinking back to it. They're fearful of leaving them, you know, their parents or whoever. Um, What'd you guys think about this one? She was like, she get, shared some of those flowers that she was picking right at the beginning on the cliff. She's sharing those with her dad and 
All right, see you later. <laughs> I, just some of the best animation in this episode was eating. It was, I mean, yeah. the way their mouths worked when they were eating was just so <laughs> chomp, delightful. Chomp, chomp. And, and just, yeah, just such pure joy in, in food. And I thought that was, that was beautiful. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I think you're exactly right. Like there is not a, and especially thinking on some of the other episodes from visions, this series yep. where we've had departures to either to the Sith or to the Jedi. And this one is, I mean, first off the Jedi usually say you need to come with us right now. And to say, you can think about it. Take a fortnight. That's so, um, like just respectful. Yeah. Maybe that two weeks gave her the time to process. Say again, Chris. I, I said our Lord didn't even give people that much time. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> yeah. yeah. Drop your stuff now and come with me or forget it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was just the best daddy daughter moment. Oh my goodness. And one last little snack and all right, see ya. <laughs> That's great. That was really good. Yep. And she on that on that uh spaceship she was she was just intrigued she just wanted to see what was out there and she wasn't scared she 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 knew what was coming for her was going to be good and she knew her voice wasn't going to be suppressed anymore and there's one color that carried all of that through can you guys guess the color yellow think of the jedi yellow yeah so mm -hmm. when au was at the mine there was a path of yellow when the wind blew out at her that followed her all the way down to that other cave entrance, which was also wrapped in yellow. And then mm. the Jedi ship is yellow and all that just represents hope and joy. And it's like, oh, that's just, it's just like, you know, a little roadmap. So perfect that she knew she was on the right path. It was their little yellow brick road, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Follow the yellow brick road. So what do you guys think about Ao's song overall? Any final thoughts? Uh, 10 out the, of 10. The one thing I noticed about <laughs> the song itself was it was her name that she was singing. It was always Ao that she was <sighs> singing. I'm so glad we do and these I, on a panel because I don't catch all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um. And I, I just thought, you know, part of it is like, maybe that's where she got her name. Um, oh. but also just like, I don't know when, when, uh, we were talking about the role of sacred music and, um, so much of sacred music is just singing out the, you know, the name of God, you know, when we, when we're praising God, what we do is we just say, basically, we recognize who you are. You are God. You are good. You are marvelous. And, and look at all the marvelous things you've done. We're singing his name. And, and so there's a sense of that, that singing a name is, is a powerful thing. Uh, I uh, loved this episode and I enjoyed it more, the more I watched it. And of course, talking with it, with all of you enhances the flavor even more. Um, one aspect we didn't talk about too much, which I thought was uh, quite powerful, was the whole idea of being called to something, having a calling. And uh, I loved Kratu's line where she says, uh, we cannot choose where our call will take us, whether we will answer you know, yes or no to it. And I thought that's very much in line with the idea of a vocation that and responding to a call to a vocation you're sort of just letting God then take you where he's going to take you. Um, the vocation of marriage, you don't know where that is going to go. The vocation of the priesthood, you, um, you may vow obedience to your bishop and he can send you wherever. But the importance is whether you're going to say yes or no. Uh, so I loved that aspect of this episode dealing with what a call is. Mm, now I'm picturing her in a yeah. beautiful Jedi cloister somewhere singing away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do and we have Sith any other singers? They're all purified. It's like, oh, beautiful. 
That's awesome. What do you guys think about any connections to the other episodes in this season? Well, having the diamond connection, the diamond connection kind of ties back to the pit. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, there are the bad diamond mines and the pit. And so this is almost like the hopeful version. You know, life can be done right. <laughs> I was wondering if uh, if this is set in 19 BBY and you guys have made me question that a lot. Uh, but if that's true, <laughs> is the will the Sith find or, you know, Palpatine, essentially, will Palpatine, Vader, the Inquisitors, the Empire, will they come in and exploit all those crystals? That's that's a whole yes. lot of crystals they could put in, in <laughs> Project Stardust, you know. Yeah. Oh, golly. Now I'm really sad if they did that. <laughs> yeah. I just want Aou to go to the uh, the big opera house and sing Palpatine straight. Although he'd probably explode from the inside out. <laughs> <laughs> I bet she can do oh, it, my. though. <laughs> Yeah, it actually kind of ties together a lot of the themes from other episodes. There's the there is that answering the call and and joining, you know, following the the path of of discipleship in the force. Um, and there's the yeah, the kind of the mystique of the kyber crystal and the process of of obtaining them. And then there's the singing. There was the, that other um, sort of operatic uh um episode and i'm forgetting the name the of it now but answer yes exactly yeah. um and and um you know just the idea of art in general of of how artistic expression has a uh, a connection to the force um and there are several that several episodes that that kind of touch on that and um so in a way it makes sense that this is the final episode because it ties all of those threads together in one family little story Don't family oh yes i mean always family right yeah they've been in every, uh, almost every episode i think mm -hmm. yeah some form of family yeah yeah, great parent-child bonds in a lot of these. Yeah. To end on such a hopeful note, I was really worried in the beginning because there were so many of them that walked that gray area as if it's okay to use the dark side. And it kind of was like, uh, you know, you're making it like, yeah, it's okay. You can use it if you need to. Right. And this, this literally clarified everything. <laughs> it was like... <laughs> yes. Dark side singing away. Let's just go to the light side. Let's clear it yep. up. <laughs> so do you guys think we should be expecting a season three and would you want one? Yes, please. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, more please. Is there enough animation studios out there to, to keep getting different views of it? There's gotta be. Oh yeah. I mean this is this is also a great way for, you know, smaller animation studios whose names don't begin in P and end in XR to, to get their, <laughs> their names out there. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And be associated with star Wars. You know, I'm sure yeah. a lot of them want to do that. I mean, this is really some of the most interesting star Wars I've, yeah, I, I would put the visions seasons up there with my favorite star Wars. Um, because yeah. they're so interested in exploring the the possibilities and the nuances and um you know it's like this is this is kind of what i wanted from the uh what they called the anthology films you know the a star wars yeah. story you know that aren't supposed to be directly connected to the skywalker saga oh right yeah mm mhm it's like, oh, yeah, this this is really interesting exploration of the galaxy far, far away. And I want more of it, please. Yeah, I would love to see, even if it was just follow up graphic novels or little stories or anything, especially with Awu and the others, you want to know more. Give me give me what happened before. Give me the follow up. What happened after, you know, a little three book series or something, because they're just they're, they're wonderful stories. You know, I'll, I'll probably play them out in my head in some direction anyway. So. <laughs> yeah. So I was going to finish up with a little bit of news. Uh, we, we're coming up on an hour. We don't have a whole lot of time to discuss it. 
But uh, we've gotten a little bit of information on a release date for Skeleton Crew. They're tentatively looking at December, but they're also considering pushing it back to the first quarter of next year. And based off what our new Disney CEO, our new old slash old Disney CEO, <laughs> Bob Iger, uh, he's saying we need to put the brakes on a little bit of Star Wars and Marvel content. Um, so I'm wondering if we're going to have to wait till next year to see that one. But we got Ahsoka coming up, so that's going to keep us satiated for a little bit at least. You know, and then, of course, we got the the writers and uh, actors strike to affect all that. So might be a little bit of a gap. I don't know. We'll have to see how that plays out. So we'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create Secrets of Star Wars, including Billy C., Placid K., Patrick C., Heidi M., and Helen O. Their generous donations at SQP on, sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the Secrets of Star Wars and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Be sure to subscribe to the show in Apple Podcasts, Google Play, TuneIn, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or on the SQPN YouTube channel. To find previous episodes of St Secrets of Star Wars and to send feedback, please visit sqpn.com slash Star Wars. You can email us at starwars at sqpn.com. You can follow StarQuest on social media at facebook.com slash starquestmedia or on Twitter at SQPN. Be sure to join the awesome discussions on our Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord, one of my favorite places to chat with folks. We'll be back in two weeks when we will be discussing all things Ahsoka. No spoilers for, this, for the series, just building us up to why we're expecting a series. Until then, I want to thank Catherine the Artist Laffery for joining us, especially on all these mission, Visions episodes and giving us your insights on the art. We appreciate you. Yeah, oh, thank you. I love talking art. And officially now the Dadalorian, Chris Hagen. Thank you as well. <laughs> uh, you're very welcome. Good to be here. And Robert, the Guardian of the Wheels King. Thank you for joining us. Well, um, I'm just trying to follow my calling. <laughs> And once again, I'm Jason Yuji. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Star Wars on StarQuest. Quest.